Hello and welcome to the Tiny Little Workshop's adjacent space. Here today I will be unboxing the brand new TCL 6 series television and just going over some basic measurements and features and what you can expect to find right out of the box. How about some measurements just to start out? We'll get the exterior of the box dimensions so you know if it'll fit in your car, per se. According to TCL, this is 34 and a half inches high, 55 inches wide, and 7 inches deep. The 65 inch TV has exterior box dimensions of 65 inches wide, 43 inches high, and 8 and a half inches deep. And now, the fun part. Actually, cutting it open. Three bands. and then just some tape. I picked mine up from Best Buy, so the outside of the box is in nice condition. Hasn't been bumped around in the back of a freight truck or anything like that. Well, I guess maybe it has, but not as much as if it had gone via FedEx or UPS or something. Let's get the camera in here. We'll see what kind of packing materials there are and how well protected it was in transit. Now here's an interesting little tidbit. Between the old P series and the new 6 series, the 55 inch TVs have managed to gain four and a half pounds. 32.6 for the old, 37.1 for the new. First up, it looks like we have the instruction manual, the cords, the batteries, and the remote. Let's see what's going on inside this bag. First up, let's get the uh, remote out of the way. For anybody who wants those numbers, there they all are. This is the basic remote. The more advanced one comes with a voice search feature. The premium remote found on the R617 model also operates over radio frequency instead of infrared. And one interesting thing, the headphone port that was on the P-Series premium remote is no longer a feature on the 6 Series. The remote's pretty much the same as last year's. You've got four buttons down here now arranged vertically. There's the side profile. There's the other side. You've got mute, volume up and down. You've got a little rest for your finger. And underneath the battery cover, you've got a spot for two AAA batteries. No model number or anything under there or under here. There you have the power cord. You'll notice it is not polarized. And this is what is known as a C7 end. The 65 inch uses this style, the C17. I bought the 55, so I got the C7. Let's measure how long this is. Okay, so from one end to the other, it measures five foot almost on the nose. Next up is this adapter dongle. I think this is called tip ring ring sleeve. You have composite video and then you have left and right channel audio. This has to be plugged into the TV. I'll show you on the connections where this would go if you're going to be using composite connections. Next up. Some TCL branded batteries, AAA, they slide into the remote and away you go. We also have the four screws for the feet. I believe that these are M5. And last of all, the instruction manual. Next up, the top styrofoam protector, which also is housing the feet one on either side. After that, we've got the television. On the side with the screen, I guess I should say on the side facing the screen is this large, thick piece of cardboard. It has a piece of styrofoam in front of it between it and the outside of the box. And then there are styrofoam pieces on either side of the TV to protect it as well. So I decided I needed some more room to work with and I thought I would just grab the box and put it down on the floor. Turns out that's not how this box operates. Once the banding is removed, the entire top of the box can just come straight up and off. 
the only prior TCL that I'd had was the last year's P series and I bought it factory refurbished and it came in a different style of box. So I was not aware of that. So something <laughs> to know about for sure. Okay, big old thick piece of cardboard. Custom cut foam to protect the screen. And then we've got these corner protectors. One on either side. Whew. I'm making static already. I live in the southwest United States and you can't do anything without making static somehow. And then here we are. The main event. Facing the camera is the screen. On my side is the brushed metal finish of the back side. It does appear that it has a little plastic film covering the bezels on the outside and perhaps the back panel as well. The back panel seems kind of shiny. I think I'm gonna take just a minute to look at the feet and see how to attach those before I go any further. Now these are some very sturdy and well-made feet. They look to be solid cast aluminum and they have little grippy rubber pads on the bottom. I did measure the height of the feet from the bottom of them to the bottom of the frame of the television is two and three quarter inches. Got the feet, let's see how we put these on. If I'm not mistaken, this should just kind of pop right off. There you have it. If you're going to be putting this on some kind of a mount, you would leave these in. If you're going to put the feet on, then you pop these out. Now you'll notice there's a little notch here on the foot and there's a little bump on the mount. So you can put the foot on this way, which is what it shows in all the literature and in the owner's manual, or you can actually flip this around and put it in the other way. It also accepts that even though it has that little bump, it still fits and you can still thread the screws in. See, there's some wiggle room. You can probably almost see in the camera here, my TV stand, the television is about perfectly centered on it, is actually slightly too short. My TV stand comes to about here. It's actually a table that I bought at a thrift store and refinished. So what I'm gonna have to do is invert the feet and attach them this way. In that case, look, I've got a good, almost a foot of extra clearance there. And this is perfectly stable when it's done this way. There you go. Still sits perfectly flush. I'm going to put the other one in and we'll be able to stand it back up. Let's measure this real quick. Inside edge to inside edge, it is 27 and one quarter inches. Outside edge to outside edge, we have 29 inches exactly. This is not the way I'm going to be using mine, but outside edge to outside edge, four foot, 48 inches. Inside edge to inside edge, about 46 and one half. I know some people are going to be interested in just how wide these bezels are. And it looks like they are one quarter of an inch on the sides and top, while the bottom bezel is three quarters of an inch. Now that it can stand up on its own, we'll talk about the backside first. You'll notice that the visa mount is below the center line of the TV where the bulk of the <laughs> weight probably is. It is a 200 millimeter wide by 200 millimeter tall and it uses M6 by 16 screws. The 65 inch is a 300 by 300 pattern, just something to be aware of. On this side, we've got the power the AC cord in. And on this side are our audio and video connectors. We'll go over those now. The connections are basically the same as last year's model. You've got three HDMI 2.0 ports with HDCP 2.2. The only one that supports the audio return channel arc is this third one down here. You are supposed to have close to the same lag as last year's P-Series. There is one 
10 100 ethernet port it is not gigabit you have a reset button your coaxial connection for your cable or over the air antenna there is a SPDIF optical again your one HDMI part with arc I have seen reports of people successfully passing Dolby Atmos through the HDMI 3 port of this TV a USB 2.0 port connect a thumb drive something like that to be able to show images video audio on the display you have your AV connector which I showed you earlier this little dongle here that gives you your audio and video and then last but not least headphone down at the bottom of the set you'll see the infrared receiver for the remote when I was on the underside putting the feet on you could see the two speakers down there it has eight watts per channel personally I haven't used the TV's built-in speakers since the days of the cathode ray tube but they are there and they do work there is an option in the menus to shut them off completely if you're like me and you don't wish to ever use them. With the TV plugged in and turned on, it starts out running you through the initial setup screens. This is all standard stuff like setting your location, intended use, internet connection method, all that kind of thing. Now I had to tell the TV to scan for networks a number of times until it finally showed the 5 GHz network in my house. The 2017 P-Series did the exact same thing during initial setup. Once the network connection was established, it automatically downloaded and installed an update before rebooting itself. After this, the Roku activation screen appears with a URL and code for you to activate. You do have the option of controlling this TV from your phone via the Roku app. There was one final reboot. And there you have it, all ready to use. I'll show you real quick where to go in the menus in order to disable the internal speakers. It's found under Settings, Audio, TV Speakers. In case this is of concern to you, the light on the power button does light up when the set is turned off. It is not illuminated when the set is on. And it is possible to go into the menus, find under the correct settings where you can turn off the light so it is not on at all when the set is powered off. Something I want to go over are some new things found in the advanced picture settings menu. The first one is called Action Smoothing, which is, as it turns out, motion interpolation. It is the so-called soap opera effect. I am not a fan of that, so I turned it off on mine. The next setting is for Natural Cinema, which if you turn it on is supposed to improve 24 frame per second film content, but so far it's not really noticeable on or off. LED Motion Clarity is supposed to be black frame insertion so this one can also be turned off because the disadvantages of it outweigh the advantages of using it or having it turned on if you're like me and you saw that there's only one button on this set and you're thinking to yourself how in the world do I control anything if I lose the remote when you first press the button it brings up this menu and you can keep pressing the button to rotate through the selections on this list if you leave it on one of those selections, it will select that item. <laughs> so this is the 55 inch model, the R615. This is the more basic one. They do make the 617 in both the 55 and 65 inch sizes. The 617 has the more advanced voice control remote. Rumor is that there's going to be also a 613 available from Costco. Okay, let's go over some other improvements that are in the 2018 model versus the 2017 model. TCL claims a 25% greater brightness independent testing so far has shown at least 19% improvement there. More contrast control zones. I'll put a graphic up. You'll see how this works. The 2017 P series had 72 contrast control zones this one has 96 the 65 inch version has 120 
There are, well, it still runs Roku OS. It'll still do HDR on YouTube, Netflix, and Vudu. I haven't been able to test Prime yet to make sure it does that. Here's something to know about. The app menus will look pixelated, but when you start playing any content, it'll be fine. Just for whatever reason, the app menus are not 4K. This is supposed to have greater viewing angles than the P series. I don't have the equipment to test that, but some people have been saying that it does and that it does measure at greater viewing angles. And since I don't have any measurement equipment, I can't really tell if there is a greater color volume or not. From what I've been reading, it seems to be about the same as the 2017 P series. Static contrast ratio may be slightly worse on this set, but the dynamic contrast with the increased brightness, the greater local dimming zones is vastly improved. This new model, interestingly enough, consumes more power than the old one. It still has a dual core processor and a dual core GPU, but uh, somehow, let's see, it uses 230 watts versus 165 watts for last year's model. It also still has 802.11 AC Wi-Fi, operates on both 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz bands. As you saw, it had some trouble at first. I had to keep refreshing it until it saw my 5 gigahertz network. It still does Dolby Vision, it still does HDR10, you still get the little pop-up in the corner that says Dolby Vision when you're watching a Dolby Vision source that says HDR when you're watching HDR10. It does not do, so far as I know, HDR10+, plus. only a very few Samsung models, I believe, do that. There's limited content available at the moment. That's more of a new technology, new standard on the market. Negatives, people are talking about dirty screen effect. I'll try and go into some of that and show if that is, in fact, an issue with the set that I received. I've seen some other people's sets that they've had banding going across in certain parts or kind of in the corners they'll have whiter areas and on the backlight bleeding things like that so that's something to pay attention to and oh also one big thing this is not a native 120 hertz refresh rate on the panel itself this is still a 60 hertz panel it does do as it says on the packaging 240 hertz natural motion which is their motion interpolation it also does 120 i assume um, there's also no word yet from any testing that i've seen on whether this is a true 10-bit panel or if it's the same as the 2017 p series which was an 8-bit panel with frc frame rate control so still waiting to find out about that as well and reflections, uh, from what I've read, it might be a little better than last year's. I don't have my P-Series anymore, so I can't comment on that. It seems to be doing okay in this room. I'll get some more hours on it and be able to tell better if it does what it's supposed to with the anti-glare coating and if I even am bothered by it. <laughs> That's my son down there. I had to take the remote away from him because he was pushing all of the buttons. That's how we wound up on Hulu somehow instead of the main screen. So I'm going to end this there. Thank you very much for watching and for coming along with me as I unbox this brand new piece of equipment. I'm going to go install it where it's going to live and enjoy some HDR content in 4K. I finally have a 4K player and I'm going to enjoy it. I am now back one week later to give my impressions on the TV, how it is to live with day to day, and if I've noticed any issues or problems. So the night that I got it all set up, I took it, put it in its final spot, and we watched uh, maybe about an hour worth of programming on it, and then I ran some test videos that I found on YouTube to check for dirty screen effect, that sort of thing. And it didn't matter if it was a 5% gray pattern, 10%, what have you, red, blue, green, all the colors looked great as far as uniformity goes on the set that I got. I have seen some other people have pictures with theirs with banding vertical and or horizontal kind of making a crosshatch pattern on either side. So 
that is something to be aware of and to look out for. I haven't seen any excessive blooming. I did see a little bit in an extreme circumstance with the P series. I was watching a movie and at the end credits, a big logo came up and you could see individual blocks illuminating as the white went up the completely back display. And I haven't seen that on this new one yet. I did have one freak out so far. I was attempting to load a program on the Voodoo app to stream and the TV looked like it froze. I thought, gee, this is bad, but then it switched to the main screen that says TCL, Roku TV, 4K, something along those lines. So since it switched, I waited after about maybe a minute it went back either to the main Voodoo menu, menu or the main menu, and it's been fine ever since. So I'm not sure if it was just doing some kind of an update all of a sudden. Uh, I don't know what it was, but it never froze completely, and it's been fine ever since. Now, I don't game, so I don't have any impressions of any game consoles and that sort of performance. I do watch a lot of movies, and as far as 4K playback and regular standard 1080p blu-ray playback everything has been exceptional so far i have only maybe possibly noticed a smidgen of dirty screen effect once during the last jedi during a quick pan but any other time i haven't noticed anything and even in that one time it wasn't enough to bother me to try and rewind to see if it was imagined or real so i've watched one standard Blu-ray, a couple of 4Ks through it, and has had no problems so far. It's been great. Uh, one unexpected side effect, I did have to order a new HDMI cable. I was using a Monoprice Cabernet 25-foot active HDMI cable that's compatible with 4K and HDR and all the latest stuff, but it turns out that the little chip inside that makes the cable active is not fully HDCP 2.2 compatible, so I had to go buy a brand new Monoprice Haas cable, which fixed the problem I was having, uh, just a little bit of noise on the menu of my 4K player. One thing if you're not aware of, you can get your phone, you can pair it with the TV, get the Roku app on your phone, and once you've done that, you'll be able to access expert picture settings, and there's one in there you may want to turn off noise reduction. It's meant for internet streaming programming. You can go ahead and turn that one off and it should improve things at least a little bit. I did wind up securing this TV very soundly to the table that it sits on so I don't lose another one like our Westinghouse that passed away a couple months ago in what is now called the blanket incident. So I did notice one similarity with the P-Series since I purchased the 615 model and I had the P605 of last year's model. They both came with the infrared remote, not the RF enabled voice control remote. And so with the infrared remote, you have to have it pointed directly at the screen. I've noticed that if I have my feet up and my feet are blocking direct line of sight, it won't work. I guess I'm a little spoiled because my receiver and my 4K player, you can have the remote pointed completely the opposite direction from them and they will work. So in the week that I've been using it, streaming looks great. I did find that on Prime, I found the section where you can stream HDR content and it does do the HDR flag. Everything works fine there. And uh, Voodoo works great. Uh, Netflix, I don't have their uh, 4K content, but your standard 1080, everything works just fine. The interface is very responsive. I'm very happy that panel uniformity is great on the set that I received. And yeah, everything's been going great. So I hope you enjoyed this little bit of insight into this particular set. And I guess I will see you next time.